Yes, we're listening. Hello, Bob. Bob, we're on. We're on. This is the 26th of our dialogues. And, Bob, I want to. I don't normally do this. I want to play you a very short recording of someone else um, because what they are saying reminds me of parts of what you say that probably I have problems with and don't agree with, but this might be a bridge over to them. And it's from a radio show which happens on community radio in Regina in Canada and it's presented by Ken Fox it's Ken Fox's voice and he calls it naval aviation in audio and he plays local hardcore bands and recites poetry and the title is obviously a reference to Frank Zappa it's naval aviation in art um, a, an instrumental piece he wrote which is brief and quiet and it's only just occurred to me um, because Ken's making me think about it again that naval aviation I always took it to be about the navy and the sea and the flying and of course the naval is your navel it's naval gazing so it's being able to via internal subjectivity to get somewhere in flight um, and this is what he said suddenly I found it quite shocking because he's talking about suicide it is indeed a show to kill yourself to, but no, no, not your animal self, not your corporeal being in the universe. No, please don't kill that, your earthly sailing vessel. No, nope. this is a show to help you destroy the prison of identity, embodied in resumes, class photographs, bank accounts, and above all personal property. Kill the specter of identity that shackles the imagination, which is immortal. Okay, uh, the I, I disagree with what he's saying, uh, but that uh, doesn't matter. It's a bunch of words to interact with. Uh, <laughs> why? Why not? I like hearing you disagree. It make a change. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Um, yeah, tell me he, your disagreements. Uh, it's poetic communism. He's saying get rid of private property. He's saying get rid of that sense of self, which is your career. And surely this is what you've done, Bob, because you've constructed for yourself an unbelievable biography. <laughs> <laughs> you've got rid of... The, the users, the content, they think it's unbelievable. It's all true, of course. You see, he's, he's complaining about things. He doesn't know that that's what the CIA does. We, we give up identities. We change. We give up personal property. We floating free over the planet on expense accounts. So, you know, you have to take the context of who's listening to that. Um, the people that we assume in Regina are hearing this, uh, I don't think they should give up their identities. They should inflate them. They should get more powerful and take back their power. Mm -hmm. Why suicide yourself? And, and then maybe I'd say, yeah, physically suicide yourself. Because I don't believe um, that we uh, die. I think we transition. And um, I've, I've, I've had Ion on the radio a lot, and Ion says every death is a suicide. And we were explaining that on the show, the other show today. Well, this has tipped us into complete nonsense, Phil. So um, you were saying that some people appreciate it when I get cross on this show. So now I'm completely furious because... <laughs> I um, voted Ion. Uh, no, because of this absolutely crass way in which your countercultural uh, medical way of interpreting things has misinterpreted what Ken is arguing about. Because he's talking well, about... You ask me to disagree, but I can uh, I can shift in. That's just one interpretation. Let me do a couple others. Yeah, like okay. used to say, you don't like those ideas? I got lots of others. And that means like a totally different view. And, and so he's saying that I say imagination is embedded in your identity and your property. Mm. And you, you need to see through the limitations of your imagination because you're projecting and creating your own subjective reality. And it's the instruments of the external world around you that does that. That's your imagination in action. People need to kill their imagination in that sense, not their not their body. You know, what did he? What did he want us to kill? All the IDs? No, no, don't. Uh, that, those are gone. But here in the United States, nobody lives with an ID. They uh, they get credit cards, they lose them, they get them back again. And right now, nobody knows who they are, what they are, or what money is, or anything. We've arrived at that revolutionary state that Ken's advocating. But of course, it's not a revolution. Where do you get the revolution out of this? So the the He's actually talking to the 1940s. 
Oh, well, this is the old... Now now we're back in the old, um, that my socialism is uh, dated and you're the postmodernist and you've got beyond it and yet okay, we're here in start, England, we're in the there. middle of a Try post office, yeah, but, let's you know, we're here in England, we're in the middle of a post office strike over what um, the government and uh, the people with money want to do with the post office, which is privatisation in line with what the IMF is telling governments all over the world, that they can't afford to have any services which people actually need and... I see it as very much not that change from the 1930s, and we're back to our old um, uh, disagreements, aren't we? Oh, that oh, you well, think no, we've somehow I flown on? Strikes. I think there should be more strikes. I'm all for it, but I'm also wary of how we're going to determine and get a consensus of where we've arrived once the strikes have implemented. Oh. I mean, um, the communication chaos is the bugaboo. There is no common public space. And so that that's the issue I'm bringing up. Oh. Uh, you know, the, Marx would bring this up if he was alive. He'd say, hey, yeah. boys, we... we and you bring it up in yeah way. but there's an illogic of money which is connecting everybody to each other and giving us uh, way systems of understanding what we have to do um a lot of people feel they have to get up in the morning if they don't they won't earn their money and uh, won't be able to live in the way that they want to live and so they go to and work that's what ken is referring to that's the id that he wants you to give up you know in your your bank accounts well okay. i'm not sure you see as usual i don't have any class differentiation in what you're saying because to me he's talking about uh, an illusion that we are private individuals in competition with each other that's what he's criticizing that that's an illusion. and i call it poetic communism because he's trying to find the common interests we all have he he feels the imagination and an attack on uh, the imagination is aligned to um a, a criticism of the way in which our bourgeois identities set us all in conflict with each other and so yeah, we he's agree, we agree with that uh, yeah that's right but but what are we going to say to make people do that to drop their identities you can't just tell them to do it because no the, not the at English all language is not good enough for that. yeah well uh, that was excerpted from his attempt to do that on a one-hour radio program where he is slightly restricted by the conservative nature of the program he says he can't make explicit political statements so he mm -hmm. says things in a more poetic or cryptic or uh, extreme form uh, such as you heard just then but uh, what he that is a little comment in the what the, the main part of the program is reading a avant-garde text by J H Prynne called High Pink on Chrome that was written in 1975 over um, the final symphonic work written by Edgar Varese who's the modernist composer who Frank Zappa adored and I think is the key to understanding Frank Zappa's difference from regular rock and roll that and he feels that by reading these words that he adores the way in which um, Prince has tapped part of the brain which registers different um, discourses clashing um, in the world outside us that Prince tapped that so he's trying to tip the listeners into a realm where they can see how multifarious and multiple and living the world actually is outside their individual egotistic demand to understand so i think he is trying to put into practice the revolution we're talking about and of course you could always mock it and say well it's only on community radio and who hears that but then you can mock any good idea by saying well it hasn't gone mass yet uh, good ideas are not mass i mean that's why they're ideas rather than something substantial i mean once they're mass they are substantial and they're there they're the streets we walk up and down on okay well my first response was it sounded like a disagreement and that was the uh, solid as it said but it's not my only idea uh, i agree with what he's doing he's enjoying uh he's following his fastest path to his joy to uh communicate this stuff that's uh, i have no problem with that so uh what if, if i just say yeah great um we have to move on right but yeah 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 I but I, I mean i think it's um pretty I'd, I'd say it's unique i don't think it fits into any other um attempt to alter things or to state a point of view of the world outside this program itself actually bob that yes and, w and what he said i said many times on the radio 20 years ago in toronto many times i would add complexities in there explaining how well we don't want to give up that bourgeois identity that visual space that's already gone we're talking about our new iconic identities we got to give up 
And so it was, uh, when I hear something that I've done, then I immediately uh, critique it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I know it, and it's not new for me, so I uh, mm -hmm. start trying to come at another angle. But definitely, if you think that's unique, uh, maybe other people have done it, but I did it all the time, and you can go on my timeline and hear those shows. So uh, I claim what he was doing. I find it difficult to think that you could ever speak with that degree of fervent, poetic weight that Ken has. You're a different personality, Bob. Well, maybe I'm different now. Back then, back then, it's, there's hours of it on my timeline. You can you can hear me ranting. I had two hours and uh, very passionate. Yeah. And, uh, so I thought, I, you know, I'm 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 probably a little more laid back in relation to you because you're passionate and I'm interested in what you're saying. I, I think if I started if I started trying to outpassion you, uh, that would cancel the sound out. And uh, I'm being polite here. Uh -huh. uh, you have not heard me in other radio shows I do. Uh -huh. I mean, you're not getting all of me on your show, so to speak, or all the ways that I respond to the present. Uh -huh. You you evoke a certain kind of response in me. Yeah, and th that's mutual. That's uh, the particular um, unique alchemy that we're pursuing as a, a possibility of a, a theoretical development that might... Um, shift people towards a different mode of action, isn't it? That we think yes. that there's something and unleashed when we talk together, however much we formally disagree, or however different we are, that something goes on when we think together, which is beyond what we can do individually, and that maybe more people could join in, it could cluster and actually produce a wave going right the way across the world. Yeah, I agree. You see, the reason I don't speak as much is I've never heard anybody say my stuff back to me <laughs> till I met you. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the fact that you bring in Wyndham Lewis and Awake and the Avant Garde and Zappa uh -huh. and Marx and McLuhan, all stuff that I've discussed uh, in the past uh -huh. only to myself or um, you uh -huh. know, on the show with my co host yeah. who didn't know what I was talking about. So I'm interested, in, I'm actually hearing my echo, and that's, oh. it, that probably puts me in a more reflective response. Oh. And that's why you, when you say a bunch of stuff, and I go, well, that's exactly oh. what I thought. You know? Well, and that's something I'd like, to, I'd like to pursue a little bit more. I mean, on the, um, on the 25th hour that we've done together, the last show that we did, I wanted you to tell me if you thought the avant-garde was dead. And in talking about that, we, 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 we found a lot of common ground. Um, but the way I'd uh, off mic in our little chat before we switched on the recorder and started doing the show proper you were saying that a lot of the stuff that we have in common is absolutely unknown to people who listen to the radio or out there it's it's simply unknown so i was wondering if we could explain what this stuff is as apart from just mentioning names and actually say what we think it it, it constitutes or, or what how would you describe this stuff to somebody who's never encountered it okay let's go start off with spinning its wake what i like to always say to the appropriate audience is that spinning its wake is rock and roll in print and someone should hear that if they've got any kind of curiosity. He said, well, how could that be? It was written before rock and roll. I said, yeah, that's what's interesting. This is rock and roll in print. Oh. That's a, a loaded statement. So that's what Finning's Wake is. Oh. And then Wyndham Lewis disagreed with that. <laughs> he, he, from a very learned, satirical perspective, disagreed with the production that was rock and roll in print. And then that's an issue. There's your debate about whether rock and roll is alive or dead. And then what do we bring in? Then we bring in Karl Marx. Well, a large part of the world does study Karl Marx. That's important. And then you bring in the other guy that influenced everybody, but nobody knows it, and it was suppressed, and that's Marshall McLuhan. You know who he is? No. Well, he is, he's the one that made you think there was a revolution happening on your TV screen, and now that you're bored with. See? So that's, uh, that's how I begin. Now you tell me what you think they, the four things are. And then there's Frank. I, I forgot about that. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I always try and explain Finnegan's Wake by actually showing people a page from it. Because yeah. have you ever seen a book written in jumbled up words that don't seem to make any sense until you start reading them out loud? Which is, I suppose, its relationship to rock and roll in the sense that it has to be a, a musical experience before 
you're allowed to start thinking about it that if you don't respond to that musical experience the book is closed to you you can't read it um, without mouthing the words because otherwise you're going to miss all kinds of things which aren't um, aren't spelled out for you but are there in the sounds so yeah, it's, you got to sing along with it yeah you've got to sing along with it and it produces this um uh, i mean when you say rock and roll of course rock and roll covers a multitude of sins um yeah, but in I its mean rock uh, music, in its music. yeah in its um original form um i think the blues um and the, and the way that we respond to it is not culturally learned i think it is physical and fundamental that the particular notes which the blues decides to emphasize will work on any human being anywhere whatever their cultural baggage or their musical traditions and that's why it's been the primary um, weapon for um, capitalism to break down different uh, cultures all over the world and, and create a world culture that's exactly and McLuhan said that rock or blues blues in the 20s was the universal Esperanto or united the world mm. that's uh, a global language you're, yeah. you're agreeing with McLuhan he's agreeing yeah. with you um, but of course this and is very you see I services, but, though, that allowed the uh, national movements to be subsumed mm -hmm. in an entertainment state but um, being a Marxist having said that I always like to um, then divide what I'm talking about in terms of the different positions of capital and labor and therefore the blues is used because it has this chthonic basic power that speaks to everybody but its uses under capitalism its commodification actually leads to something completely different and doesn't lead to this unity but leads to backing tracks for the invasion of Iraq you know the, the rock and rock or some kind of rock I hate to call it rock and roll because it's become so um, kind of pokey and unsensual and uh, uh, a different um, body alignment is implied by it it's become militarized um, yeah but it, it it also bypasses any grand design on a 1984 level like george orwell if there were some military people who wanted to have a nuclear war or some kind of global conflict and then bring in a world fascism after that rock as entertainment basic and blues distracted everybody so that they couldn't propagandize there's the service of the entertainment state mm -hmm. they, the military couldn't get to get the, the old 19 or 84 orwellian propaganda going because everybody was digging their own rhythm mm. well i mean so it's a, a lot to do point. with the um um insubordination in the troops in vietnam was to do with Hendrix being played and and uh, um, decisions to get into music rather than take seriously the orders of your officer and the yeah. lack of military discipline was very connected with the counterculture and with music. Um, That's right. The electrified musical blues world creates a tactile dialectic where it's a huge oh. burden on the commodification level, but it's also a freeing. Like it's beyond the right and left, good and bad dialectic. It's, it moves us into a tactile, strange, involving hypnosis. Oh. which can be liberating yeah i mean i remember listening to um when the sony walkman first came in and you had the possibility of good stereo sound while you're moving through the city um you know, the personal um personal stereo and listening to electric ladyland on it and there being a moment where i realized that this music was making me get off the bus and not go to work that it was so utopian and lush and luxurious and fantastic that it was inviting me to to drop out quite literally to to not obey the injunction to go to work um but to, but to, to you know that and and it was the new the innovation of the personal stereo which brought it home to me again what this music had meant 10 years before to to, to people um Okay, so you then you wrestle with going to work. Now, what's interesting, you walk around and you on the subways there, you see everybody with their little earplugs in and then their little bubbles, right? And they're all utopian mood. And uh, it's almost like that's frightening as a fragmenting, fragmenting of the public space. So everybody goes mm. and becomes a robot more to mm. keep the unity going. And well, I, I notice this, Potter. particularly in London, because uh, I do a lot of cycling in London. 
Um, cycling sounds like something strenuous where you're sort of going fast, but cycling in London is a way of moving fast, and there's all sorts of interactions because you're continually at traffic lights and making decisions and queuing next to other people and, and so on. So it's a very social activity. And my idea of being a cyclist is that all cyclists have interests in common and we like to warn each other about cars or make decisions about where we're going next. And so I like to talk to the people around me. And I find that half of them are complete zombies because they have white wires leading up to their ears and they're listening to a soundtrack. And I can't have a conversation with them because they're listening to some music which is cutting them off from um, this possibility of, a, of, of an exchange of necessary information and um, humour and uh, genuine community. So I found the, the, the personal stereo quite limiting um, in terms of what I want to do um, in London at the minute. Right, and so you, you have to realize people, average people walking around, seeing everybody in their own little tube, I assure you they will complement that, balance it by having hyper uniformity. And I think that's where uh, the Harry Potter fads come in, those kind of consuming one book, is people wanting to have a sense of a unified public space that there's a common sharing. That is, if you don't like that, that uniformity, that's a disservice caused by the utopian bubble you have when you have your Walkman listening to Hendrix. You see, mm. they, this complementary co ecology is going on all the time. Mm. Yeah, it's and, like, yeah, the, the opposite springs out of, of yeah. what, what you think could be progressive about something. Um, although the, you see, I'm fairly certain that the music being listened to is not anything as... Um, anything actually like Hendrix. Um, yeah, but, it, but they, every generation has a certain yeah. ear, and they're liking what they're hearing. They're feeling good. Mm. It yeah. may not be politically uh, revolutionary. I don't know. Conceptually, it doesn't encourage you to do something, but it does make you feel good. It is a drug. It's the soma of our time. Music is the soma. You know, soma mm. from Brave New World. Yeah. Yeah, well, music can be the soma but it can also be the it can be something else and that and that's what interests me i mean it's yeah if do me trescue if is anybody walking along the streets listening to do me trescue you know, like you know what i heard from the wire yeah i don't i think that gives a different reaction well i think do do me trescue's moment is now is is it, it, it's now the hendrix of our time and we reached a position last uh, week when we had this hour of talking where we suddenly decided we were into monoculture, that, that we'd had enough of uh, this pluralistic world where everybody's allowed to do their own thing. And we want a monoculture on a new level, which is the relevance of Finnegan's Wake, because if everybody read Finnegan's Wake together, it wouldn't unify them in the Harry Potter sense, because there's enough... Because the Wake is designed to take the world inside out and that's why Frank Zappa is very similar to Finnegan's Wake in terms of finding if you find the correct alignments of culture to reality you can construct a work of art that is as infinite as reality itself because you've understood the ways in which reality is structured and you can build them into your work in such a way as that you yourself are not responsible for everything you're putting in there but you're allowing the world to cast shadows on the page that you're writing itself so that it has a kind of objectivity. And I think that is the immortality that Ken Fox is talking about. He's talking about not the private individual seizing of what the world is and then being able to tell people and own that picture, but um, an opening out that allows the world to fall in so that when it's examined you find you thought you were analyzing the art and you find you're analyzing reality which is what i find continually with frank zappa and i find it with joyce i find it uniquely with them that in so far as i get obsessed with different fragments of it and try and understand them and go for help and read talk to other people and so on i find out that by the end of that process i haven't really found out about joyce or zappa i found out about something in the real world but with this extra urge within me that isn't bored or alienated from the knowledge of the world that so often is an obstacle to going out and investigating the world. Yeah, the, if I can remember, McLuhan said in his book Take Today 1972, he ends the book with his solution. 
He said, over the past hundred years, <coughs> we've been lulled by the replays of the tribal unconscious. But now with the retrieval of forms of consciousness, it's a resurrection. He makes a pun on it. And so I asked him, uh, what are the recent retrieved forms of consciousness? And he said, Finnegan's Wake. And you take a Finnegan's Wake reading group is a module of a totally ecological situation where people are looking at the same text, but they can hallucinate and project their own things. And they're constantly in a tactile dialectic, noticing the other person's different interpretation than you, but you're also sharing the same space. See, there is a, a an ecology. That's the balance. Mm. And but I'm the, restating what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, this sounds like the kinds of things which a lot of post um musicians try and do. Um, but for me, it's always tainted by a certain, a certain kind of... Makes, listen to this. That they, I just got inspired. That yeah. That's what's unique about the book. McLuhan used to say in the 50s, what's the role of the book today in the 50s? Knowing it was totally obsolete as a constituent to formative medium. But Finney's Wake figured out how to do it, how to keep the book alive. It's a precious experience and do it in a group thing, group session with the Finney's Wake reading group. That is uh, a solution to all the conflicts oh. of cultures and their different values. Oh. Um, it, it, it constantly makes you aware of the ongoing hypersubjectivity or just subjectivity while trying to see if there's a common space or meaning oh. or purpose. I mean, what, what more yeah. perfect environment than that? Yeah, because and, it's... And so if you present a musical thing or a painting or any of the arts, that doesn't work. The mm. book is the only thing, the only medium that can create a homogeneity. But the wake counters that constantly for each individual. What, what, what a marvelous solution. Mm. Because the thing you're saying about creating a, a space in which people can exchange things is, is often the, the music I'm interested in gets saddled with that idea and in general it's a kind of moral injunction that actually prevents me from joining in because i'm um impatient with the uh, degree of bullshit going around which guarantees the community if you see what i mean whereas yes. at a finnegan's wake uh, reading group i am completely challenged myself by every sentence i'm excited by um um words I see that remind me of other words and I'm completely um, exposed and interested and intrigued myself so I'm really there and one of the things that gets missed out of the way people talk about um, cultural objects is the necessity to involve even the um, the very critical or the uh, skeptical um, that that so often the nice things about culture are celebrated and then you end up saying yeah but um what's in it if i if i don't actually um f uh, like being told that i ought to join in that's um, right there's there's always a point to normal culture there's no point no point of view that joyce is saying and joyce even said to me through a medium that he made sure that it was always a race so nobody could find the core meaning under it and he made sure it was all erased, so there's actually no nothing, but that's not important. You participate with it. And you. And on top of that, the beautiful mesh that he makes of the H-C-E-A-L-P uh, letters going all the way through, he's actually showing how language works in people. Uh -huh. the, 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 the way it's a logos, it holds people together while allowing individual mutation of it. I mean, what... As McLuhan used to say, what a marvelous creation this is, oh. this book. I mean, he actually solved the communication problems. And then he also, he talks about, uh, you know, Cranley in The Portrait, who was based on Joyce's friend, Jay Byrne, I forget his name. Okay, but yeah. He lived at 7 Eccles Street, where Leopold Bloom did. All right? He lived all his life, this uh, J.R. Byrne, J.J. Byrne. And he was a, uh, he invented code. And he tried to sell his cracking of code and his, you know, perfect uh, cryptography to the Pentagon or whatever it was in the 30s and all this stuff. And then McClone points out that there's one section of the first question, you know, from page 126 to 140, the, the Finn McCool answer, you know, that long section. It describes Finn McCool and the answer is Finn McCool. Remember that? Yeah. You know, the beginning yeah. of that, okay. that section of Finning's Wake uh, where it goes through the characters. Um, there's a part in there that describe, Joyce describes the way Prynne or Cranley made this little gadget. The point is, is that Joyce figured out what Cranley couldn't get. 
there's there is a response by Joyce to his buddy. In other words, Joyce created an ecological crypto cryptographic experience, commenting on the effort to be cryptographic in secret that Cranley slash J. Bryn Byrne was trying to sell. Mm. Anyways, that's a, that's not a known Joyce factor. Mm. I mean, it, it's very little known about uh, that reference um, to uh, his childhood buddy. You know what I mean? Mm. So um, that, I cite that as how. Uh, and that's what McClellan meant with a marvelous creation. He'd actually solved all the problems of communication to the point you're not asked to be anything like you object to by fitting his way. You're asked to participate and watch how others participate and, and become mm. kind of aware. Yeah, and that's therefore it appeals to a certain mentality and a certain um, mind that doesn't want to follow or adopt another point of view but is intrigued by actually interesting things the the mentality that wants to look into complexity or um textures of interest or intriguing things but doesn't isn't looking for something to identify with it yeah, isn't yeah. looking for a prop in fact so it's actually appealing to um, people whose uh, psychology is actually quite worked out and aren't dependent on external things to give them a sense of self. And most mass culture is to do with marketing identities that complete gaps which people feel they have, which is why it's not actually culture that's worth investigating since it's actually got a therapeutic function or a fix-it function within this system and I think what we're saying is we want to remove all those fixes so that we can see the real gaps in people's lives so that they could do something to actually change them rather than yeah. using it like a drug. Yeah, I was just going to say that you're not going to be too interested in your neighbor's uh, medical anesthetics they take, the mm. drugs. You maybe if they're a dangerous person, if they're not on them, you hope they keep taking them. Mm. And that's what modern culture is. It's all therapeutic. Mm. And we don't have to be in that situation. So when you talk about a person who's interested in exploring the type that might be interested in spending his wake, he is forced to deal, he cannot go into that as an elitist or as trying to be an individual unique phenomenon. Mm. You in a fittings wake group are forced to, you're all cancelled out and everybody's on equal footing of no well, nothing. Th that's what I, I've always found in a Finnegan's Wake reading group. You always find that somebody who knows about I don't know, the inside of a car can tell yeah. you, well, actually, this works like that and, and, and this word. Whereas uh, if you look at the um, kind of often Joyce is bracketed with other uh, writers who in the early 20th century, writers were allowed more um, uh, allowed to create uh, less social work in the sense that they were allowed to create completely incomprehensible architected things like um, Pound's Cantos or The Wasteland or, or, or what have you. But the, so they all get swept into the same thing and it gets taught on literature courses as if they're all doing exactly the same thing. Whereas I think um, the works of uh, uh, Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot are designed to flatter a certain sense of, um, of expertise, cultural expertise and elitism in a way that Joyce undermines that. Exactly. The, the, they are the uh, Lewis, Pound, Eliot, and maybe Yates are the four analysts, the four old men, and he's piercing them. He's making fun of them because mm. he had solved the problem of communication that they failed at. Mm. I mean, he, and look at the, it's the most democratic. You can bring anybody into a Phineas White group. Uh, you know, someone who mm. know who's a janitor and knows a lot of stuff about cleaning mm. supplies. They will find that in the book. And then they will yeah. talk and you'll find out about janitoring that you didn't know. So it's the most yeah. United Nations evoking of a, mm. the group knowledge that's hidden in, um, in language. But this is extremely subversive to most people's sense of what's culturally valuable because I'd say that most people's idea of what's culturally valuable is something which um, shows that you're a better person than the next person. You know, that, well, that if you yeah, remove like that... Esther says, these, these classical musicians are like Christians. <laughs> They're trying to save themselves or be isolated or to protect themselves from the mm. dirt. Mm. And, and Joyce really undermines that. Yeah, which is why it's like rock and roll in the sense that the, the, the blues musician is appealing to something which is not the trained musician, but somebody who will admit that these things affect their body. So it's appealing for a kind of um, 
education in de-education or uh, um, getting rid of repression which was the kind of uh, really the 60s idea which has been so uh, abused since then as sexist and oppressive and bad um, and this this 60s idea that education might be as much about um, uh, de-programming ourselves as it is about uh, building something up um, has been like attacked and attacked in, in, in every sort of area that I can think of. Um, that, that if you hold on to that idea, you, you're, you're told that you're naive and you have a, um, a metaphysics of presence, that you actually believe in the world, and that this shows that you are incredibly metaphysical because you have an a priori belief in a, in a, in a world and a body and, and, and emotions that are prior to talking about them. And of course, this is nonsense because you can't prove they exist. And this is, goes back to the old idealist um, argument which Socrates had to deal with that came from the sophists. It's a very old uh, philosophical trope, uh, an, uh, an old argument. Um, uh, where does that leave us? Okay, so, uh, well, it's called, McLuhan wrote about that, the sophists against, uh, against the dialecticians, the ancient quarrel in modern America. And mm. he saw that in Finnegan's Wake, and that, they, that is in the classroom section of uh, the school book section of yeah. Finnegan's Wake. Um, but the the thing is, not only is it, it, it creates an environment in the moment for any group of people of the ecology of consciousness or the ecology of perception or the training of perception, it actually also, as McLuhan saw, was a warning about why this would all be undermined with new technological environments coming in, which is what uh, undid the 60s. The, the digital world changed the world from what the 60s thought was coming. Oh. All right, in the counterculture, and McClure and and the Finney's Wake is useful for even you warning you on that point. And if you really get into it, as as follow what McClure and how he cracked it, it tells us a lot. As well as not how, look, how could you beat that? It provides an environment of the most democratic or hedonistic impulses, or whatever you want to call it, you're into your joy, ecstasy, and at the same time provides a form of knowledge that that all the social sciences were yearning for. It actually mm. figures out how cultures are created, shows you how it's done, and shows you the grammar of cognition within it. I mean, you can't ask more. That's way better than the Bible. I want to restate what you're saying in, in completely different terms, and I wonder if you can see a parallel with it, which is what I um, don't like about the way 60s uh, rock culture developed was basically can be summed up with two words, which is Rolling Stone. And what I dislike about that is the sense of understanding and owning the music developed by people whose actual writing is doing nothing on the level of um, the music that they're describing. Everything's pushed out into the music and so that you get descriptions of music as being um, moving and um, uh, passionate and uh, um, relevant and political and uh, social and so on, but described in a way in which the language being used to describe it is the very opposite of anything that could be at all like Finnegan's Wake. And I get alerted to where music is interesting, where suddenly the language being used to describe it has some of the exciting obscurity and denseness and light and shade of a work of literature like Finnegan's Wake. What I mean is that for the person who's glimpsed what language can do, who's drunk at, at, at the drunken language of Finnegan's Wake, they're going to find reading Rolling Stone extremely disappointing, whereas there is a possibility of writing about music and a possibility of a kind of journalism which would be rich in the way that that language is rich and we glimpse that a little bit in the counterculture with some of the writing in Oz or some of the um, science fiction which appeared between about 67 and 71 that in those high years of, of social unrest all sorts of popular forms developed this quality um, experimental science fiction went absolutely ballistic in those years you, you can pick up books which are just extraordinary that, that they're in paperback with garish covers and everybody was reading that you can't believe with it with the kind of close down after that the kind of streamlining of culture which is all about obedience and respect for some kind of skillful writing which is outside your own um your own creativity in dealing with with 
incomprehension. I think it's incomprehension is the thing which um, the, you have an elitist idea that incomprehension is the thing which holds back the masses from appreciating something. Whereas, in fact, incomprehension is the is the carrot on the stick. It's where you don't understand something that you become curious. That's that's the thing that's irritating and that draws you on. Um, and so, if something has nothing incomprehensible in it, there's nothing for you to do. And it, in fact, it's boring. And the confusion over that issue um, puts people at sea with 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 understanding what what. Um, what you mean when you say you like fitting his weight because regularly it gets thrown back to me that that's an elitist p position whereas I'm saying it's actually the, the position that wipes that out that's elitist yeah you wouldn't know it's elitist unless you joined the fitting weight group you see in, uh, I've been in many groups of the fitting weight reading groups and the newbie, the newbie comes in and he's, he's shy does, he says well this is very hard to understand and then he just sits through and doesn't contribute much just watch gets used to the language and within a, you know, several sessions, they start to realize, Jesus, nobody here knows what's going on. Maybe I could say something. Mm -hmm. And they actually get their power back in relation mm -hmm. to a group. And all the inferior complexes goes away in relation to uh, thinking culture is elitist. You've got to be smart for it. So, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Finney's Wake undermines the very thing that people think mm -hmm. it looks like. Yeah. But they, don't, they haven't experienced the group yet. I want to mention the other thing is that uh, a person who agreed with you uh, about the Rolling Stone, you mean Rolling Stone magazine, right? Yeah. And it's a fact in 67, 68, was Richard Meltzer. He's a very interesting guy. He, You read his uh, his rock criticism. It is, he doesn't know it, I don't think, he never says it, but he understands that Finnegan's Wake, or that rock and roll in print, Finnegan's Wake, he tries to write that. He doesn't even know he's redoing Finnegan's Wake. But he, he, got, he says that rock died in 68. Okay, so then he was, he kept staying in the game, but he wrote such surrealistic, wacky reviews uh, that the record industry kicked him out. So, so he's a symptom of showing that something took it over in 68, 69. Mm. You know what I mean? A yeah. A, a, a corporate thing. And the music, a lot of great music was made, but the social meaning of it was gone. Mm. The social revolutionary. And then you could get into, McClellan had a larger view of why that would happen. And that has to be considered, the, the, the huge superstructure of media. And then you get into individual expression and the Ken Fox response. So that's okay. So I'm just saying that Richard Meltzer, it's interesting to read his stuff and how he responded. And he came up with exactly the point that you, you, you're a replay of Richard Meltzer. Ben, <laughs> and you, you haven't read him. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear. I always feel if two people agree on something without having read each other, it's not a criticism of them. It's more an illustration of the objectivity of what they're saying, that this, um, these particular points of view are not the result of our identity, but the result of our imagination of the isomplastic whole, and therefore is immortal. Yeah, the isomplastic whole, that's the phrase I'm talking. I'm looking for when I said superstructure. But yes, no, I agree with what you just said. Um, you can arrive, that's the unifying point. Oh. You, you actually and can have objective perception of what's going on beside oh. your hypersubjectivity. And once you've, and once you've understood that there is a one which is happening all around us, and then you understand that any fragment of it, if seen in the light of the whole, can illustrate it is, is, is a way of seeing it and then you, this is where chance and randomness come in because you, you realize that chance and random um, activities and um, source, sourcing materials at random is actually the thing which challenges your own sense of the whole and actually makes you do work to find what the whole is in a way that if you just tick over your concepts of what the whole is without challenging it with something uh, chosen at random from the environment uh, you, you, you're no longer imagining what the whole is and this is the reason why um, radical modern art needs randomness um, and it, it's it's and this is confused with nihilism by the classically trained people who just see this as um, uh, a love of nonsense for its own sake but it's actually because of the the challenge to the uh, the attempt to imagine the whole in a, in a real sense that that's why it's there it's not there simply because one's running away from any attempt at comprehension Exactly. I, I, as you were saying, I was thinking, um, 
people, if you want to start a religion, I'd start a religion around Finnegan's Wake. And, you know, you have to go to church every week, and you got to have a Finnegan's Wake group. Now, here's the thing. You would not have the same group. If you end up going to a Finnegan's Wake group, after a while, a pecking order comes in. And depending on people's biases, it's like the group we went to uh, when I was there in April 2008. You know, it was a control group eventually. You need to have different people form the group and, and start a game with Finnegan's Wake. You know what I mean? Every time you open the book, you're starting a game. We, we haven't got any progress on it, but let's try it again. So that would be... You see my point there? Yeah, well, it's, it's the that, opposite of having someone tell you what something means. It's yeah. It's because that isn't really particularly interesting i mean this is the problem with expertise i mean i've had moments where i've brushed with becoming an expert on jazz music and um, and actually such a it's it's toxic you know that the that expertise in that area is isn't it is nearly always a um, a very partial set of experiences a partial set of exposure to a few gigs and a few records which the person then turns into some kind of um, legislative point of view whereas an honest um uh, record of an individual response if shared can allow people to uh, develop uh, an objective understanding because you understand your own relation to the whole um I mean, it's not exactly. that it isn't that we are saying we don't want to understand the whole, or that we're running away from it. We're not postmodernists who say any talk of totality is um, terrible and totalitarian, are we? No, the, you see the whole unfolding, and you participate in it. Um, the tribal people used to say, "I participate, we participate." The sun, you participate in the situation. That's the wholeness, and the, and it always creates synchronicity that makes you think there's something uh, connecting you beyond yourself. That's inevitable in a creative situation. Mm. And that's always what happens when you get a group of Phineas Wake. Everybody starts seeing synchronicity in their own lives, in the book. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, a li it's a living environment. It is actually a great TV show, a great radio program, a great movie, great opera, a great book, a great everything, great baseball game. And, it's, and, it, and you are the center of it. Yeah, you're the center of it, Bob, but you're breaking up, so I've got to stop. Uh, the recording there and and re-hook up our Skype hang on I mean I, I find what you're saying helpful because it's I've always thought that there's something in Finnegan's Wait which is beyond just a book I like there's something that makes me want to tell everybody they ought to read it they ought to experience it not because when they've read it they'll come out like me but because here is a um something you should dive into and experience because we don't have very long to live on this planet and if you haven't experienced that then what have you been doing um, <laughs> in, in the same way as i want people to experience the musics that I, that i've been through but somehow the musical side is always being considered um something easy i mean this is partly my own background with educated english parents that if you put on a record you're not really doing anything you're just sort of absorbing something whereas if you're reading you're kind of uh, being active and it's a good thing to do um whereas uh i don't really accept that because i think um the, to experience um the records that i've experienced the 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 amount of out i've had to do in terms of my life and 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 my normal set of expectations has been gigantic you know they're far harder work than simply absorbing another book yes and when i think of reading your poetry uh and the stuff you read on your show i i just occurred to me they i'm not interested in in that but what your writing should be presented in a group like Finnegan's Wake, and then people uh, react mm. together to it. Yeah, well, you're, you're uh, actually uh, producing group writing, which well, actually fits into your values. Yeah, but at one time it was a group because when I first started thinking about Zappa, it meant going to see someone called Danny Houston and having arguments and ideas and my idea was always that that should be funneled down and put in print so other people could join in this this kind of listening session i mean for me listening to records has always been a matter of sitting around enjoying yourselves drinking playing records and arguing with people about what that record to play next and whether anything's any good or not and being persuaded by other people this record you thought was good is actually rubbish because it sounds like this or it's actually very good because of that and altering your aesthetic choices because of what the collective argument is doing that's where hey, all 
this is where well, good r- music writing comes from and you can always tell the music writer who's actually fallen out of that and become the kind of the guy who's how's it um oh, some he's got ang- a point of view but let me let me say this you know McLuhan said that conversation he liked the drama of conversation and conversation is the best and what he meant was that's the greatest art speech is the most democratic art that's what you're advocating yeah. You don't sit around and consume. You you see what conversation it sparks. Any cultural event is for that. Mm. And people say, I like going to movies and talking about it after. It's the talking. That's basically what humans are. They they really love talking. And you can use culture not to to mm. stop conversation. Yeah. It has to be uh, argued with or countered or see what happens. So if that's yeah. what your that's what our revolution is about. And the world's so tiny now. Conversation can rule. But in order to get conversation to happen, we need to fire off blocks to the to the um, blocks and um, blockers. We need we need objects, and I think the, the here um, weird uh, la- non-standard language has an effect that if you get the intensity created by, for example, J. H. Prin has created a community of people who all argue with each other that Dumitrescu doing his music in that way, producing this kind of obstacle to the assumption that um, th- th- that we all know what the good music mm-hmm. is, that, that this problem created by some artists, for me, is the thing that creates community. And if you try and create community without that, you leave something out, a, a critical spirit, a, 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 a demand for something, um, some experience which, which, which enters your subjectivity. I mean, because there are many attempts to create community which have no real place for any special art. They just say, well, let's have some salsa, you know, let's have some, uh, you know, uh, some sort of nice music that everyone will enjoy. And for me, it's just when you have the music that people don't enjoy that everybody starts talking. That's why I like it. That's why I like the problems of the avant-garde. Because the kind of music that just creates community which um, there's no, no one has any problem with it, it's merely pleasant, doesn't make people talk. In other words, yeah, for you, talk is the most valuable art. Yeah, it's it's where, I mean, what I value most about political demonstrations is where you're walking down the street and there's someone else with a banner going to the same demonstration. You say, where have you come from? And you manage to break down this absurdity, which is you don't talk to each other in this society when we're all experiencing incredibly similar things. Right, and while we're talking about this, I've got Mick Jagger in mind. What, <laughs> what's your opinion of Mick Jagger? What's he doing? Is he helping us? Uh, I don't think he's helping much. No, I I kind of um, have affection for him simply because of his singing stance and the and the he saw a guy prancing around. Were you the one telling me about this? You know the the particular Mick Jagger dance he copied off somebody and that mode of oh, yeah, behaviour. George Gomelsky, George Gomelsky yeah. at the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that. Um, and and because my brother used to imitate Mick Jagger up and down the kitchen, and it's a whole <laughs> physical um, spasm that you do when you respond to R and B music. But I find that that whole um, thing very funny, and uh, allows helps me articulate how I feel about Muddy Waters music. And so, Mick Jagger is one of the uh, people that helped me understand Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters, and I can't forget that despite all the terrible things he's done in his life. Yeah, well, like, I don't know what he's doing now. What, is, is he reported on in the London press anymore? No, I've, I haven't heard about him for years. He's laying low. Yeah. He's hiding out. Yeah. And and you say his life activities became negative. Well, it, it doesn't seem to have... Um, I mean, yeah, I... I yeah, he, he, he's, he's a screw-up if he doesn't join our Finning's Wake group. I think absolutely. our group, our revolution is the standard-bearer for civil interaction yeah that that's it and i think uh, i mean i always found it difficult being a music journalist where i was always asking musicians to measure up to my sense of what's culturally interesting rather than going <laughs> and uh, worshiping at their feet <laughs> yeah you, you went in to the specialists and tried to make them comprehensive by reminding them hey the whole point of this is to have speech and discussion yeah, yeah no, that's you're it. great you stimulate yeah. discussion yeah. but hey are you ready to talk yeah yeah <laughs> yourselves yeah, yourselves, yeah. and users they're not. Yeah, and the kind of conceit induced in money-making people by their managers and the sort of cocoon that they're put in because they have this ability, because they have the fame to generate cash, is kind of um, repulsive. There's a certain atmosphere around those people which flatters yeah. them, and they, and they become kind of nauseating. And everybody knows this, which is why 
Yeah. People Everybody knows this. Will become uh, grotesque. Leonard Cohen saying yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, the, the, it's friendly fascism. But what's interesting is that the reason people put up with it is that it was a new technological medium, a new extension of the century life that hypnotized them and, and they enjoyed the play of seeing rock on TV and whatever other media we have today. That's all new. That, that glitters. That distracts you from the bugaboo of the friendly fascism. That's and it, that's Bob. What our revolution, what? And that is what our revolution's about. Yes, that's what it is. Good. We, we finally told everyone. Thanks very much, <laughs> Bob. <laughs> that was. Thank you very much for talking for an hour with me. That was Bob Dobbs. My name's Ben Watson, and you've been listening to the Bob and Ben Show. And that was the twenty-sixth episode. Please join us next week. Bye.